In this video, we are going to look at the CPU performance equation. The CPU performance equation is used to compare different processors. And the most fundamental way in which we compare processors is to try and understand how long a program will take to execute on that processor. Now, the program execution time, the total time required to run the program, TP, is given by NC, which is the number of clock cycles required to run the program, multiplied by the clock cycle period in nanoseconds. Now, the number of cycles itself depends on the number of instructions typically. And usually what we can imagine is that if we have more instructions to execute, they are going to take more clock cycles. However, to some extent, this is also dependent on the instruction set architecture. For example, in risk type ISAs, where you cannot, for example, directly issue one instruction to operate on memory and take values from memory, add them up and store it back into memory, you would need to break it up into multiple instructions. You would need to load from memory into register, perform the ALU operation between registers and write the value back into a register, and then do stores to get the data back into memory. Clearly, this will result in more instructions. CISC ISAs, like the x86, for example, could potentially have fewer instructions. Now, although this sounds like it means that CISC ISAs might result in fewer number of instructions, typically this comes with other problems. And very often, CISC processors have to break things up into multiple clock cycles in order to implement them. The other thing that could happen is we need more clock cycles per instruction that in turn would also lead to more cycles. Now in a single cycle CPU, we know that every instruction would take exactly one clock cycle, but we have also seen that this is impractical for a number of reasons. One is that different instructions take different amounts of time and therefore you might end up wasting the utilization of your hardware. The other is when you have constraints such as the different kinds of memory access patterns. Now the number of cycles taken per instruction depends primarily on the implementation and not on the instruction set architecture. Because as we have seen, it is possible to imagine that we could take an instruction set architecture and make a hardware architecture that is actually able to implement each of those instructions in a single clock cycle. Therefore, the actual number of clock cycles that we are going to take for each instruction is dependent less on the ISA and more on what choices we make while actually designing the hard hardware. Here, of course, we need to have considerations such as what is the common case? What are the common instructions? And based on that, what would be the number of clock cycles that we are going to use for each instruction? So let's try and understand this number of clock cycles a little bit better. In general, what we can say is that the total number of clock cycles for a program is going to be the sum of the number of clock cycles for each instruction. If ci is the number of clock cycles for the ith instruction, then summation over all instructions, i is equal to 1 to n, assuming there are n inst instructions in the program, summation i is equal to 1 to n of ci would give us nc, the total number of clock cycles. We could also rewrite this in a slightly different way, where we say that rather than counting the total number of instructions, let us try and concentrate on the number of instructions of different types. So for example, if nk is the number of instructions of type k and ck is the number of clock cycles required for one instruction of type k, then nc would be given by summation of over k is equal to 1 to capital K, nk into ck, where this capital K is typically much smaller than capital N, the total number of instructions in the program. It is also just a property of the ISA. Just to clarify, what exactly I mean by capital K in this case is the types of instructions. For example, in our case for the RISC-V ISA, we would have ALU type instructions, load instructions, store instructions, and branch instructions as the most basic types of instructions. In other words, capital K would just be equal to four. The assumption of course that we are going to make over here is that all instructions of type K take the same number of clock cycles. In other words, an example of that is all ALU operations could take one clock cycle. 
Now, even this, strictly speaking, is not absolutely necessary. For example, we could consider an implementation, maybe where we want to have a multiplication as one of our instructions, where we decide that a multiplication operation alone, even though it uses the ALU, could take several clock cycles, whereas an addition or an OR operation could be done by the ALU in a single clock cycle. However, this assumption that the number of cycles for in an instruction of type k is a constant is a simplifying assumption that we will work with to understand the performance equation further. So based on this, we can now try and develop this concept of CPI, the cycles per instruction. As I said earlier, this is determined primarily by the implementation, the hardware implementation that we choose, not the ISC, for the simple reason that you could take an ISA and make a single cycle implementation. Usually, it would be the CPI, the cycles per instruction would be fixed for a given instruction. But you could also have a situation where, especially with complicated instructions, such as moving blocks of data from one location in memory to another, the number of cycles required for the instruction could also vary. Typically, though, this is fairly easy to determine and can just be done by an analysis of the hardware. The other thing that we would like to keep in mind when we are trying to compare processors is that we want to find programs such that we have a good mix of different instructions. And the instruction mix essentially means the average number of instructions of different types. Clearly, this is program dependent. For example, I could have a program which just has a series of ALU operations, or I could have a program that has a lot of jump instructions. Maybe there is a lot of branching to be done. Usually what is done is that based on experience, a number of different benchmarks have been created. And these are used in order to obtain typical profiles of programs that are going to run on a given processor. This instruction mix clearly depends on the program that you are evaluating and on the instruction set architecture. But the interesting thing is this instruction mix is typically not dependent on the hardware architecture. That is to say, we don't really care how many cycles each instruction takes. So whether or not we take a single cycle implementation or a multi-cycle implementation, the instruction mix for a given program would usually be the same. The reason I have inserted a maybe compiler dependent is that in certain cases, compilers, if they know that certain operations are going to take longer, may actually replace them with other operations that take fewer number of clock cycles. That is a sort of second order effect and we are not going to look further into that. As a first order, at least, we can say that the instruction mix is primarily dependent only on the type of program and on the instruction set architecture and not on the hardware implementation. So based on this, we can now think of computing an average CPI. This basically is a weighted average of the cycles per instruction taken over the entire program. In other words, this is a combination of the two things we considered earlier, the actual cycles per instruction taken for each instruction and the instruction mix taken for the program itself. This average CPI is going to be program dependent, but one thing we can do is by taking the typical benchmark programs, we could average over several of them and estimate this average CPI even as a property of the CPU itself. So why is this CPI useful? Because what we can do now is to replace the NC in the performance equation with a combination of two different terms, the IC, which is the overall instruction count, and the CPI, which is the average cycles per instruction. What's the advantage of this? The IC, the instruction count, is program dependent. The CPI, the average cycles per instruction, as we saw, depends primarily on the, it's a combination of the hardware implementation and the instruction mix that we are dealing with for the program. So the reason why we find this performance equation written in this way, as a multiplication of these three terms, right, the instruction count, the cycles per instruction, and the clock period, is that it allows us to separate out the different aspects of the implementation. 
the TC is primarily technology dependent. In other words, with smaller and faster semiconductor technology, TC would come down. We would be able to make the overall program run faster. The CPI can be controlled by the architecture designer. You could decide on a single cycle implementation or a multi-cycle implementation, or you could decide which particular instructions take multiple clock cycles and how many of those clock cycles. Of course, it would also have an impact on TC itself. And the instruction count essentially depends on the program itself that you are trying to run. So by writing it in this way, we have managed to sort of separate out the different things that influence the overall running time of the program. And as computer de designers, we can then decide which one to focus on. So let's take a few examples to try and understand exactly what this means. Let's consider a program, we call it program A, and a CPU, which we will call P1. Program A contains 10 to the power of 9 total instructions. Right now, I don't care exactly what the instructions are or what program A does. I'm only looking at the total number of instructions. However, I do have one additional piece of information, which is that 70% of the instructions in program A are ALU type instructions, 10% are loads, 10% are store operations, and the final 10% are branch operations. Now, as far as CPU, the CPU P1 is concerned, I have some additional information. Namely, it has a one gigahertz clock and it is a single cycle CPU, meaning that all instructions take a single clock cycle to execute. The question I'm asking is, what would be the total time required in order to execute program A on the CPU P1? We can just evaluate this in a fairly straightforward manner. The total time is going to be given by 10 to the power of nine, that is the total number of instructions into the average CPI, the average cycle score instruction. How do we get that average cycles per instruction? We know that 70% or 0.7 fraction of the total instructions are ALU type and they take one clock cycle each. Similarly, 0.1 are loads, 0.1 are stores and 0.1 are branches. But in this case, all of them take a single clock cycle each. So this term within parenthesis over here is effectively the total, the final CPI of the overall program on this particular processor. In this case, of course, it is equal to one. And what is the clock cycle period, TC? That is equal to one nanosecond. So when we multiply this out, we find that the total time required is one second. Let's consider a variant of the processor. We call this processor P2. The same program, so 10 to the power of nine total instructions, same instruction mix. But in this case, our TC is now 0.5 nanoseconds. We are running at a two gigahertz clock speed, but it's no longer a single cycle implementation. All instructions take two clock cycles. What would be the time required for running this? 10 to the power of nine into the average CPI, which in this case is 0.7 into two plus 0.1 into two plus 0.1 into two plus 0.1 into two. In other words, as expected, all instructions take two clock cycles. The CPI is equal to two. Therefore, the total time required is exactly the same, one second. Even though the clock period became faster, each instruction took twice as long, and therefore the total time required for the program remained exactly the same. Another variant of the processor, in this case P3, now this has actually made some changes in the hardware architecture. Over here, what we say is that 70% of the instructions are ALU type, which have a CPI of one. That is all ALU operations finish within a single clock cycle. 10% of the instructions are loads and they take three CPI or three cycles per instruction. 10% are stores, which finish in two cycles per instruction and 10% are branches, which finish in two cycles per instruction again. I now have a TC, a clock period, which is 600 picoseconds. And the question is, what is the total time required for running this program now? How do we do this? Once again, we take the total number of instructions. But in this case, the effective CPI is computed using this term here. 0.7, this corresponds to the ALU operations. 
point 0.1 into 3 corresponding to the loads, point 0.1 into 2 corresponding to the stores and point 0.1 into 2 corresponding to the branches. Overall, when you compute this, you will find that this is 0.7 plus 0.31 plus 0.2, 1.2 plus 0 0.2, 1 1.4. 1 1.4 into 600 picoseconds gives us 840 picoseconds or 0 0.84 seconds. So what does this effectively tell us? It means that by having different numbers of cycles per instruction based on the type of operation, we were actually able to bring down the total time required for running the program. Why did that work? Because a large fraction of our total instructions were ALU type, and we were able to get them to operate at one clock cycle per instruction at a much faster clock, that is 600 picoseconds, as opposed to the one nanosecond that we originally started. Let's do the same thing with the risk 5 example that we had earlier. As we saw, the load instructions, for example, would take 800 picoseconds. The store instructions would take 700. ALUs would take 600. And branches would take 500 instructions. Once again, we have an instruction mix, which is 70% ALU and 10% each for loads, stores, and branches. For the single cycle implementation at 800 picoseconds, I can ask the question, what would be the total time required for a program? Or alternatively, I could just ask, what is the average time per instruction? Essentially take the program, the total number of instructions in the program and divide out the total time. The time per instruction is all that we really need in order to compare different possible implementations, provided that our final program is going to remain the same and the instruction mix does not change. So what would be the case over here? With single cycle, everything is going to be 800 picoseconds. And as you can imagine, the effective CPI is 0.7 into 1 plus 0.1 into 1, three times. The time per instruction is that CPI multiplied by 800 picoseconds. So the average time per instruction is precisely 800 picoseconds. What if we change this around and say that 70% of the instructions are ALU, but ALU operations are now with a CPI of one. That is to say, ALU operations finish within one clock cycle. The loads and stores take two clock cycles and branches take one clock cycle. And all of this is with a clock period of 600 picoseconds. If you recall, this was one of the alternatives that we had considered as a possible implementation for a multi-cycle multi -cycle CPU here. The question that we can now ask is, what is the average time per instruction as before? Now, what we find is the effective CPI is 0.7 into 1 plus 0.1 into 2 plus 0.1 into 2. This is for the loads and stores. And finally, 0.1 into 1 for the branches. The effective CPI, in other words, is 1.2. In other words, for this particular program mix, that is 70% instructions are ALUs and 10% each of loads, stores, and branches, the effective cycles per instruction is 1.2. And what that means is the average time per instruction is therefore that CPI multiplied by the clock period 600, or in other words, 720 picoseconds per instruction, faster than the original, which was 800. So clearly we can see that this particular multi-cycle implementation is probably a good idea. Are all multi-cycle implementations a good idea? Not necessarily. Let's consider another one of the examples that we had. Here we went down to a clock period of 500 picoseconds. But now, because it was 500 picoseconds, we found that ALUs also had to become two clock cycles. 10% of the loads and stores, or that is to say 10% of the instructions being loads and stores, also need two clock cycles each. Only the branches alone are able to finish within a single clock cycle. Will this help us at all? Well, no. And the simple reason is because ALU operations are now going to take two clock cycles of 500 picoseconds each or one nanosecond, more than the original 800. What ends up happening is that the overall effective CPI becomes 0.7 into 2, that's 1.4, plus 0.1 into 2, 1.6, plus 0.1 into 2, 1.8, plus 0.1 into 1. 1.9. So the effective CPI, in other words, is 1.9. And that multiplied by 500, which is the clock period, gives us 950 picoseconds per instruction on average. Let's take one last example. 
in this case, what we have is we once again have the instruction mix exactly the same, but we have pushed the clock period all the way down to 300 picoseconds. And now we still have the ALU taking two clock cycles. But remember, these cycles are now 300 picoseconds each. So the total time required for the ALU is actually 600 picoseconds, which is the best possible time that you can have. The loads and stores will now take three clock cycles and branches, just like the ALU, can finish within two clock cycles. What's the average time per instruction in this case? If you find the CPI, you'll find, once you do the math out here, you're going to take an average of 2.2 .2 clock cycles per instruction. But 2.2 .2 multiplied by 300 is still 660 picoseconds per instruction, which is considerably faster than the 800 picoseconds per instruction that you had for the original single cycle, and even faster than the 720 picoseconds that we had when we chose a clock period of 600 picoseconds outright. So overall, the CPU performance equation allows us to split up the factors influencing or controlling the time required for running a program on a processor. And we can then decide what we as processor designers have control over. In particular, as a processor architect, you can choose the number of cycles per instruction for different programs. As a software architect or from the compiler point of view, you might want to attack the other problem. Can I change the number of instructions or the mix of instructions? In particular, if you find that ALUs can have a large influence on the final time, perhaps you want to also make the number of ALU operations even larger so that the architect could then say, fine, let me concentrate on bringing down the time required for ALU operations even more. So there are a number of different trade-offs that come about and that can be implemented as processor designers and the CPU performance equation plays a very important part in understanding what these are.